So welcome to the Writers Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little bit more about how they wrote it. Um, my name is Zach Powers. I'm the Director of Communications at the Writers Center. I'm also a novelist and short story writer, so a fiction person primarily, and that's what has qualified me tonight to talk about the subject with one of my uh, oldest writing pals, Thomas Calder, and I'm so excited that you're joining me here for this event. Thomas, welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. It's good to see everybody else and all the names popping up. Uh, do you have your book handy? I have it right here. Could you please read us a little bit of the book, just so those of us who haven't read it uh, have a taste of what they can expect? Yeah, um, I'm going to read just a short couple paragraphs, and it's some backstory about my main character, Ford Carson, kind of um, looking into his ex-wife's new love life after they divorced. So this is in the early 2000s when Facebook and MySpace were kind of just uh popping up and all you need to know is that ford's son is named bailey so you'll hear that name ford's ex-wife is emily and ford refers to her new boyfriend who will eventually become her husband as shark man um so here we go early on ford tried not to pry into his ex-wife's new life but on certain nights when the headlights read dull with the headlines read dull and the commercials kept rolling and he'd scrolled past every desperate status update from every desperate old high school pal, he'd succumb. At first, the spying reassured him. On Emily's feed, there was no mention of her new shark-jawed bow. Clearly, they weren't serious, but Sharkman's absence soon made Ford uneasy. What if, unlike all the others trying to post their lives into meaningful existence, Emily and Sharkman didn't need the sort of desperate online confirmation? Ford's fear was briefly mitigated once Shark Man did start appearing. Clearly, they were miserable. Who else shares an entire album of bowling alley pictures? But before long, a new problem emerged. Ford couldn't put Shark Man away. He tried laughing off most of what he discovered. Shark Man was not merely an attorney, but also the shoeless frontman of an acoustic, middle aged three piece rock band called New Day Rising. Ford acted for his own private benefit, like it was an accident when he clicked the link to New Day Rising's MySpace page. Pictures appeared that he hadn't anticipated. Emily and Bailey off to the right of a small coffee shop stage, smiling as New Day Rising performed its latest set. All the while, Shark Man's vocals came through Ford's computer speakers in pants and moans, a shameless, albeit failed attempt to sound like Bono. His lyrics were what drove Ford to close out of the site. Your beauty like a rose, sweet darling. Your petals, my Milky Way. And I'll end it right there. Thank you. Uh, and I will endeavor to sound like Bono for the rest of this, uh, this interview. I, I realized as I was reading that line, that didn't sound like Bono. <laughs> <laughs> you have to practice your Bono impression. Yeah, I do. Another reading from that section. So just real quickly for everyone, who the heck are you? Yeah, so I'm Thomas Calder. Um, currently, I am the arts and culture editor at Mountain Express, a weekly publication in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, Asheville's where my family, my parents grew up, but I grew up in South Florida, went to school at UF for English, and then eventually graduate school for creative writing at the University of Houston. Um, in between that, I hit up a bunch of workshops, which is where I met Zach. Um, and yeah, I've been writing fiction uh, for for a long time since I was like 18. I started really trying it, and then when I was like 23, 24 is when I started uh, attempting to write a few. No I wrote a few novels that never went anywhere, um, but it, it was good practice. The the true rite of passage for all fiction writers is those novels that never went anywhere. Yes, yes. Um, so the first craft question, which I, I, I like to ask, this is a question we ask all our guests, and it's, and it's yielded some interesting answers. So here it is. What's something you do as a writer that nobody has ever seemed to notice or comment on before, either in general or for this specific book? For example, in my latest project, uh, I found ways to, to have the two words, uh, to have two words in the same sentence that contain anagrams of clusters of letters. Uh, for example, the title of the, the novel is The Migraine Diaries. So the R-A-I in migraine is repeated in the I-A-R 
of diaries. And so it's a random, otherwise pointless thing I just chose to do as I wrote was try to find ways to do that in the book. So is there anything weird or interesting you've done in your writing that no one's noticed? Um, I guess I plagiarize a few lines from T.S. Eliot occasionally in the novel. I mean, sometimes it's clearly the characters are speaking about the lines, but then I also used a few, kind of sprinkled them in at a couple places in the novel. And I think I've done that, um, not T.S. Eliot specifically, but I think I've done that in other stories where I just like to pull, you know, certain lines that from songs or something. And I think I might've gotten that honestly, not from like another uh, literary writer, but David Chase and The Sopranos. He likes to do that with some of his characters. Um, he uses lines from, from rock songs that his characters then speak. And I've always just been intrigued by that. Music is really big influence in my writing. So I don't know. Yeah, especially, especially this book, maybe that'll be an improv question here about the role of music in, in this too. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that's interesting, and and so you're a blatant thief, and we appreciate that. Yeah, but... yeah. I mean, not a lot, but a little occasionally. Not now. I want to go back through and try to try to catch them, but also I feel like your music knowledge is 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 probably a little better than mine, especially with the subjects at hand. Maybe I don't know. Um. So I did. I did. This is a craft chat, but I did with you since I've known you. We met in 2009 um, at the Leslie. Leslie University Writers Conference in, in Cambridge, outside Boston. Um, and then the next year we sort of, we coordinated, I don't know if we agreed, but we, we, we communicated before both going to the Tin House Workshop yeah. uh, and hung out again for a week. So we met, uh, I mean, about 12 years ago now. Um, and so I sort of know, I was a little further along, I'd done my, my online MFA program and you were sort of doing this process, I think to decide Mm -hmm. how you would proceed with with the creative writing career but I mean from very early in what we were doing we've known each other so yeah. I feel like this is a good chance and it's related to craft about the journey of being a writer and so yeah. I was going to take advantage of that and, and and start there um can you just talk a little bit about your journey journey from wanting to be a writer to being a writer to publishing a novel absolutely yeah um so as I kind of alluded to earlier like my senior year of high school is when I started I tried writing my own version of Catch-22 um, and it was not very it was like yeah it was my own version of Catch-22 because I was obsessed with that book at the time Catch-23 Catch-22 20, 20, and a half um, and uh, yeah so I did that for a year or two in, in college and then I put writing down to kind of pursue music for a short period in college and then I picked writing right back up after I graduated I had this really out uh, this when I was 18 I was like here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go to college I'm gonna study English and I'm gonna write two books by the time I graduate and they'll be bestsellers and then I just get to write for the rest of my life and that obviously didn't happen um so then yeah I continued writing after college and I didn't know what to do so I contacted a professor at the University of Florida um, and he recommended hitting up some workshops and then kind of deciding from there whether or not to go to graduate school. Um, ended up going to graduate school, really kind of locked in on writing this, this novel while I was in graduate school, was kind of obsessively uh, revising it, revising it, revising it until I revised it to death. Um, and I had a short story that I was working on as well at one point, which turned into the wind under the door. Um, and then, yeah, I think I hit that point where my fear was always like once graduate school ends, I won't have, to, what, what happens if I don't have time to write? And then I got out of graduate school, took on a full-time job and still found that I was writing at night. And I was wondering like, you know, if, my wife and I, as I mentioned, we have a two-year-old. So when we started thinking about having a child, I was like, if I have a child, I'm never going to write again. Um, and then I had a child and I found that I was still writing at night and I wasn't getting very far with publications, but, um, but I had that kind of moment where I realized like, I'm always going to write. Some people maybe play tennis, some people maybe do whatever, but I'm always going to write. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. And once I kind of reached that point, that was like a really good, like, okay. I'm going to do this no matter what, because I can't not do it. And that was kind of where I, that was my mindset when unsolicited um, reached out to me about 
in my book. So, yeah. So, so you mentioned that you did a lot of workshops after undergrad. You did some of the summer workshops. Yeah. I, I mentioned the two we went to together. But I think that year, I think in 2009, when I met you, I think Leslie was, wasn't that your third one that summer already? Yeah, I kind of went crazy that summer. Um, <laughs> Ten House was one, yeah, and I did uh, the one up in the University of Nebraska. That's right, yeah, that was one I was yeah. That was um, a novel incubator or something, right? Yeah, because I had my catch, so I wrote two bad attempts at Catch-22. I had my second Catch-22, catch 36 um which i was workshopping there um and that was a really that was a really uh great workshop oh with jonas ag um and then 10 house and then i went to 10 house again the next year and uh both years were very interesting at 10 house yeah <laughs> we'll get to that in just one second just yeah. starting because we're going to deal with some of the i think trials of being an aspiring writer but what was the most useful thing or the most useful things you did sort of along the way during that process? What, what, what do you really relish as the best, the best things you did to prepare to, to figure out you wanted to be a writer to get to this point where you realize you're just writing every night regardless of what else is happening in your life? I think it's gonna be, a, a, I mean, I just kept writing. I think it's kind of a disappointing, I mean, maybe not disappointing, but kind of a simple answer. But like, you know, after I graduated undergrad, um, I got a job at, you know, this was right during the recession. So I moved back home and um, I, was, I was waiting tables and I'd get home at like midnight and I knew I wanted to write. Like, I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. So I'd get home at night and I just down a bunch of coffee and I'd write till like four in the morning. And then I'd wake up at one o'clock, get ready for work. And I just keep doing that over and over. So just building that kind of, you know, that's that schedule and obsession and just kind of continuing to do it and do it and do it was just getting that getting that routine in there was really important. So in retrospect, the other way, what, what would you have done differently? Is there anything you wouldn't, you would have changed anything you wouldn't have done at all? Um, I think it, it, I would have done more in undergrad. I think I would have liked to have been more involved in the writing community at UF. I was, I've always been kind of intimidated. I'm a, I'm a, I was always intimidated, still am in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would have liked to have been more involved at a younger age. But I, I also, I mean, I, I studied music as an undergrad. So I also always like, I don't regret that. I mean, I regret that I didn't dive into English a little bit earlier and read more books when I was an undergrad. But at the same time, I have some experiences and some skills in terms of rhythm and a sense of melody and things like that, that I, right. mean, I spent four years just focusing on as a young musician, which I don't think hurt me at, when I go to write. Yeah, I guess I'm just saying, like, I studied English at UF, but like, I took one creative writing class, and it was a really good experience, actually. But I was so intimidated by like pursuing creative writing, and maybe that was for the best to not do it as an undergrad. I don't know. Everybody's path is different. But like, I just kind of wish I had been more involved just in 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 the you know community life with like the English department and English, fellow English majors I feel like I was kind of in my own little you know I was in a band for two and a half years and we were kind of our own little group and we we're kind of like you know in in our own little music world but it was it, it offered a lot of interesting experiences for sure yeah so from uh, I'll turn it to so so I know because we know each other that at so Tin House Summer Workshop 2010 was probably the best, most important experience I had as a writer. Yeah. Um, you were there in 2010. You did not have that. You had one of the horror stories of, of, of workshopping. And for everyone here, I did ask Thomas in advance if he was willing to talk about this. I didn't just drop this on him cold. Yeah. The thing. So uh, let's relive your trauma. No. Um, <laughs> let's do it. So first of all, I will preface this with saying that you took a workshop with a writer who, before I knew this story, uh, I didn't learn the story till pretty well after the fact. Yeah. Um, he was already my nemesis. So yeah. this guy is, I'm not, I'm not going to say his name. I'm not a fan. If you say his name, then it's fine. Cause I won't I'm have not say, say his name. Okay. <laughs> it was a, I, I, for many reasons, he has sort of been, uh, in my opinion, a negative force and sort of dismisses contemporary writers in favor of people who've been dead for 200 years. Um, anyway, several things he's done. He's my nemesis. 
he doesn't know this, but I do. And that's all that matters. And you took a workshop with him. And uh, so what happened there? What was the the sort of nightmare story that I didn't know had happened at the time? And I feel really bad in retrospect. Yeah, we found out years later when you were visiting with Stephanie in Asheville. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was 24, turn, about to turn 25, and I was workshopping this second attempt at a novel. And I must say, in retrospect, it was not very good. And it was experimental. The narrator was incredibly loud, obnoxious. So, so I agree in the end that, you know, but the way it was presented. So I'm the first person to get workshopped. I'm, in my memory, the youngest person in that class it's my second year at tin house so there was some level of comfort of like knowing the you know lay of the land and feeling like good about things recognizing people and then i get in and my workshop comes up and um early on in the process the instructor just stops and he just says out loud to the whole class if i wasn't paid to read this i would have stopped at page two and i was like oh okay um, and then he, we keep talking, we keep talking. And then he just randomly at one point is just like, I'm sorry, can, can I just get a show of hands? Who actually liked this chapter? So then I'm like looking at the room and I'm seeing everybody like kind of not sure where to look. And I'm like, I do remember maybe like half the hands went up that they liked it. Um, and then we continued with the workshop. And by that point I was kind of just like devastated, heartbroken, terrified, humiliated. Um, but I just kept listening and I was I was kind of just like, I, I don't think I fully processed it until like later that day or the next day because then I was pretty much depressed for a good bit of the, <laughs> the week. Um, but I was really fortunate. Um, PJ Devlin was in that class, writer. Um, and she liked the story and she also kind of recognized the fact that this was a pretty bad approach to a workshop. So she kind of took it upon herself afterwards to be incredibly supportive. Um, and that kind of, you know, cushioned the blow a little bit, but it's, it's certainly like after the facts, like I remember talking to my then girlfriend, now wife, and she, we were on the phone. I didn't want to mention it because I was so just embarrassed. But she's like, what's wrong? You sound like you sound like you're sick or something. I'm like, no, nah, I just, I don't know. I just don't feel good. And it was, it was pretty devastating. But years later in graduate school, uh, writer Jamila Lang, I was in a workshop with her and she just randomly asked me one day, she's like, what's your horror story? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, what's the workshop that could have broken you? And I was like, oh, I've got that. So we kind of exchanged stories. And it, you know, obviously you go through that, like you're going to experience that and it's either going to, possibly break you and you become an accountant or you continue on and um, keep writing. Well, I'm very glad you did not become an accountant. So, uh, but yeah, I, 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 Amy put in the chat window that that's not how workshops work, uh, especially at the writer center. Right. Um, and, and I wanted to bring it up because I mean, I think that's just such like, even unless something is deliberately harmful to another human being in terms of writing like there's just you have to have like compassion and understanding and kindness and an attempt to to offer some real feedback so um anyway that horror story sorry to make you relive it but i just well his, to... his parting words were here's the good news you're young so you have time <laughs> and i was like okay thank you <laughs> oh god still my nemesis still like yeah. it doesn't ever it doesn't ever wane um so let's talk uh, one more non-craft thing while we're still going on this and much more positive. Let's talk about getting to publication because uh, um, I think you have an interesting publication journey. You have, have one that took several novels and, and, and finding a home for this one. So uh, your book is just over a week old. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, what's the coolest thing that has happened so far as part of your publication journey? Coolest thing would have been like back in December when I first announced that like pre-orders were now available because of COVID, our local bookstore Malaprops, um, you have to uh, sign, on, sign up to go shopping there, um, make an appointment. So I did that because it was the holiday time and I wanted to grab my daughter some books. Um, so when I got in there, they asked me for my name. And when I gave him my name, he's like, 
do you have a book coming out? And I was like, I do have a book coming out. He's like, oh, some of your supporters have been pre-ordering it. So that was a pretty neat experience. And Malaprops in general has been awesome. Like um, they've got a poster up in their window right now. And I work downtown. Um, I'm working from home most days, but when I'm downtown at work, I get to see my, my book in their window, not too far from Obama's book. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's pretty neat. Um, that's been cool. I'm going to measure all my successes as a, as a writer now from distance from Obama's book. That's my yeah. new standard for, for success in, in publication. Um, is there, are there any big surprises that you've experienced in publishing, good or bad? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty open with people. Like, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty anxious person, so I knew I was going to be anxious about it. Um, but I remember talking to another friend from graduate school who had a book come out a couple years ago and she was just like, you think you're anxious now, wait till the book comes out. So I think like just kind of riding that wave of the ups and downs has been not surprising, but sometimes the intensity has surprised me like, oh, wow. Yeah, this is you hit some really high highs and you hit some really some really low lows. So just kind of trying to ride that has been a surprise. So after this week and a half, and I guess leading up to it, what advice would you share with another writer who has a book coming out? A single piece or a couple pieces of, of advice? Yeah. My advice would be, I mean, I'm with a small press, so I had to I had to handle a lot of the marketing. And from what I hear from friends who are on larger presses, like that's you know the case in a lot of for a lot of writers. Um, so just getting that marketing cap on your head sooner. Cause that was something I was resisting a long time. Like, Oh, I don't want to have to, not that I don't want to have to promote it, but it just feels so grimy. So I was like pushing that off. Um, and it's just important for writers to realize like publications, like I work for a publication, so I know how far out we plan for our issues. So even with that knowledge, there were certain local magazines cause I was focusing pretty, pretty locally for, for a lot of reasons. Um, reaching out to a lot of local publications and even like six, five months, five, six months out, a few of them were like, oh, we're already planned for those months for, for our stories. Um, one publication was a year out. So just realizing like, obviously you want people to know your book is coming out. There are a lot of great books to choose from that are coming out. Um, so the more the more coverage you can get, the better your odds are you'll find those readers that will connect with it. And that means planning well in advance because yeah, the, the, the publication cycle for so many different magazines vary from a few weeks to a few months to up to a year. And I will say, so, I mean, marketing, I, my job, part of my job at the Writer's Center is in fact marketing. And I will say it is an evil pursuit, but it is, if you want to have people read your books, it is one that you sort of have to master to some degree. And there are always forces beyond your control. The best marketing plans in the world don't always right. come out, so. You just wanna feel like you, like, I guess once I got that marketing cap on, I was like, right, like I've spent many years writing and revising this book. Like I'm, I want people to know, I wanted to have a chance to find people. And yes, people on my social media feeds are probably like, we get it, you got a book, <laughs> but like, but I don't know how those algorithms work. So I got to make sure everybody eventually comes upon it. I don't know. But yeah. Um, I want to talk about place in this book. So the book is set in Nashville. You live in Asheville. And this to me seems like more than a coincidence. So why did, why did this book, the one that's gotten published, end up being set in Asheville? So it's, it's, a, it's a little complicated. It started as a short story in a forms class with Robert Boswell, the great Robert Boswell at University of Houston. So I was living in Houston when I started writing it. And it was a very different story then. And Boz has this really cool activity where each like you're, you're building a story over a course of several weeks and he gives you different assignments and different, different things to hit each week. And one of them was pulling something from your actual life experience. And then basically I based it on an experience that I, that I saw in Asheville. And then as I, you know, developed the story and it turned into a novel and the characters changed completely, Asheville in part just felt like, I mean, it's this place, my character is leaving Florida to try to basically reinvent himself and start over. 
Um, and once I got back to Asheville, you do kind of, you know, you hear that's a common story for a lot of people. They come here, it seems like this magical mountain town where you're just surrounded by beauty. And then that kind of chips away, chips away and, you know, life, you know, settles and the issues you had wherever you were coming from are probably also here in these beautiful mountains. Um, so it just felt like a good setting for a character who's trying to start over, if that makes sense. So how does your journalist, so you write for uh, the Mountain Express, correct? Um, right. and that's a, a weekly Asheville publication. So you're, I assume, connected to Asheville on a sort of weekly basis with the ins and outs of the city, especially the cultural aspects of the city. Yeah. How does your how how does your journalistic work affect your fiction and specifically for this novel? I think you just gave me some insights that I might not have had, um, especially like some of the tensions within the arts community to a certain extent, because my character is an artist and he's working in the River Arts District, which is uh, home to I think 180 artists in our in our area. Um, so some of those tensions that kind of show up in the early parts of the novel and back near the end as well. Um, and then just giving me kind of that confidence of feeling like I know a place where I'm not trying to like necessarily capture, you know, Asheville as this character, but it just, I feel, I felt grounded and I felt very, I felt confident, I guess, that I knew who my, where my characters were and what they were kind of dealing with, even if it doesn't show up in the book, kind of the atmosphere they're in that could kind of, you know, influence behaviors. So how do you balance the reality of the place of Asheville or any place you're writing in fiction with the invention of your story? What is, how much creative license do you give yourself? Yeah, um, I kind of found that it, it was kind of a gut thing. Like there are like in this novel, um, my my main character, he, this isn't Asheville specific, but what he does is he's a collage artist and he interprets songs and creates collages based off of them. Um, and in, in the case of his son, his estranged son who's coming to visit, he's trying to interpret this entire album by Arcade Fire, which is a real band and it's a real album. Um, but then the other project that he's really focused on is uh, a collage for his love interest, Grace, who is married and she has this estranged husband who's coming, but his, his, his attention is pulled between his son's work and hers, and hers is fictional. And I kind of did that. I didn't want two real bands and I don't have a real sound theory for why. I just knew like I wanted to have the freedom to play around a little more with her band and what they were and how the, how it could fit thematically with the book. Arcade Fires, uh, the suburbs kind of came like it, it hit on so many themes I already wanted to explore. So I wanted to be able to do that again. I knew I couldn't strike twice with actual not, uh, actual albums maybe. Um, and the same went for like location wise, like the Grove Park Inn, which is a real place in Asheville up here. You've been, I've toured you around there. Um, it appears in the novel and I chose not to, you know, fictionalize it because just the weight of its history um, and also some of the stories that are told in the novel that relate specifically to F. Scott Fitzgerald um, uh, just felt like I didn't want to fictionalize it. It just felt right to include that as opposed to say like Ford studio space, which isn't based, isn't based on a real studio in Asheville. I wanted to fictionalize that. Cause I thought that might be, maybe it is like, that could be something that a living person in Asheville might then misinterpret as, oh my gosh, that's my studio space. That's me. Whereas Grove Park Inn has this vast history where nobody's gonna confuse for anything. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. All right. All right, go ahead. Uh, my turn, I guess. Um, so I guess I, I had a couple of questions coming in through the chat, so I wanted to go there. Um, are there any workshops uh, that you found particularly helpful from those years of going to all the summer workshops? Uh, were there any of those that were particularly helpful? Um, and maybe why were those particularly helpful when you were getting started? I feel like I pulled something like, you know, you pull, you, you pull a little gym from everything you, you go to. So like um, 
the Nebraska workshop was an early, like was really beneficial and reminding me that I just need to get to the, like when I'm in a scene, don't, don't draw a scene out too long. If you're having too much fun writing a scene, the reader's probably not enjoying it. That's the thing that kind of stuck out for that one. I have a tendency to kind of over revisions. Obviously I'm, I'm cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down. But early on, I would write these long scenes, especially with dialogue, where the, the characters are kind of hitting the same notes. And it's not, it's a lot of back and forth, but it's not moving anywhere. Um, so that was a really important one. Um, I feel like my two 10 shop workshops, I mean, one was just learning that I could handle something that was pretty intense and not get totally knocked out. And the other one with Walter Kern was just really good because he just was like, you know, very, you just do, if you're going to do it, you just keep doing it and you do it. So just do it. And I was like, all right, that sounds really simple, but it's really, it's hard in practice. Um, so that was something like, as long as you're doing it, that's your, your writing. Um, so those are things that I kind of pulled from it. And then, yeah, the workshops in graduate school were obviously great because you're with the same people for you know, a course of three years, you get to see their work. And, and then obviously, like, I know most people say this, but like reading other people's works and offering feedback kind of just, it, it, it gets you, it, it helps you take off those blinders to your own work. And it helps you come at your work almost as an outsider, you know, like you remove yourself. I definitely think for me, the most important aspect of workshops is giving feedback and just because that's where I practice the self-editorial process. Yeah. Um, I give obnoxious amounts of feedback and I feel bad, but it's, I really don't care if the person I'm giving it to takes it. It's for me to practice looking at a piece of fiction and seeing how it's thought about, not even necessarily how to improve it, but how it's functioning sort of on a craft mechanical level. So. I, and I think what you said right there is important for people to take into account too. Like, when you're taking in all, like if you participate in a workshop and there's 10 people, you're going to get a lot of feedback. And for all those people, they're getting something from it too. Um, and it's important to realize not all the feedback, because one of the issues I had in grad school early on was I was literally taking everyone's feedback and trying to, I was like, okay, I got, I got to use this. I got to use that. I got to use that. And it's like, no, you can't take everything. Um, you have to recognize that some people aren't your ideal reader. You don't want to shut people out, but you you want to be confident enough to say, I hear what you're saying, but your reading of my work isn't what I'm actually going for. So I can take some of the things you're saying, I can apply it, but I'm also going to dismiss X, Y, and Z. Um, writer Peter Kamani, uh, he, he and I would travel back and forth from the UH campus because we live nearby. And his workshops, he was older than me, more established. And I remember asking him after one workshop, like, how was it? And he was like, it's good, but ultimately this is my novel. So I'm like, what are you gonna, like, what'd you take from it? And he took a lot from the workshops, but he's like, but ultimately I'm, it's my decision where I go with this thing. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a confidence I do not have. I, I applaud you, sir. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I think it's worth, worth remembering that when you're receiving the feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a practical question from the chat. When you're usually using actual bands and lyrics in your novel, do you need special permissions from those artists in order to mention them? And I can't remember if you have lyric excerpts. I, in your I don't have lyrics because yeah. you do. It's very, apparently very expensive um, and you can get sued. So there are no lyrics. You're allowed to use um, song titles and that's about it. And obviously you could reference the bands, but you can't use the lyrics which was a bummer because at one point I did have some lyrics in there. So without giving any spoilers, that is the, the disclaimer here. Uh, is there any, is there a central question that drives your novel? And do you think your novel answers that question? Yeah, I guess the, the question would be, um, what is, what's the risk? What's the reward of, kind of avoiding self-examination and um, can you start over without ever actually confronting why you're wanting to start over to begin with? I feel like a lot of my characters are hoping that just by leaving things behind, they can um, 
move forward with their lives. And the book is kind of them constantly being hounded by this past they can't escape. Um, and I think the book does answer what happens if you if you keep ignoring not problems so much, but just complicated uh, dynamics and complicated relationships. Um, what happens to those things? Do they just disappear? Do they magically correct themselves? Um, and I think the novel hit, hits on that. Yeah, that's great. So back to the MFA program a little bit. Um, do you think you would have been able to achieve success without earning your MFA? And what were the pros and cons of that whole process? You did a three-year program, right? First yeah, the three-year program was amazing. Because that third year, I was pretty much, a, I, I got to experience what life was like as a full-time writer. I mean, I was teaching for the university and I was teaching for a nonprofit, um, but I still had a ton of time to write. And I, I worked it so like I got, you know, all my classes, all my like lit classes out of the way early. So I had a lot of time to write. So that was really beneficial. Um, I think I would have obviously still been writing had I not gone to an MFA. I think the MFA probably, I mean, I can't say it really like sped along. I mean, my, my I've been writing, yeah. Um, I think it made me a better reader and a better writer. I don't know. Um, maybe it would have taken me longer to get to this point, longer than it already has. Um, it would have taken me longer for sure. I think it just, yeah, I'm not answering your question very intelligently. Um, I think it was beneficial in part too, just because of the community. I mean, community is so important for writers, obviously, and having other writers around and kind of being able to talk about that, just the process and just kind of like, like anything, if you work at a restaurant, you want to be able to talk to people about, you know, like how terrible the customers are. Like as a writer, you just want to be able to vent with people who will understand what you're going through. And you could get that without an MFA, obviously. Um, but there is something about just the focus and the intention when you're in an MFA, um, you know, there's something to be said about spending money too. <laughs> like, you know, you, you want to make the most of that time and, and you know, you're there and you know, you have that window, right? Like I've got two years, I've got three years to try to get as much out of this as I can. And I think that kind of, you know, helped. I, I, I will say a pet peeve of mine is when I hear people, when I heard people, when I was in my MFA saying like they were coming back to, uh, to get the discipline to write again. And I was like, well, shoot, like, I guess, yes, MFAs could help you find that discipline. But like, if, if you were relying on outsiders to make you write, once those outsiders are gone, I don't know how you continue to write. And I, I definitely, you know, I just feel like you have to have that self-discipline to write, sit down, focus. I, I've always joked that, I mean, I've, I think I've actually drawn it out because I shouldn't joke about it because it's very simple as a Venn diagram of great writers and writers who finished books. And it's like, there's a small overlap there. I know so many great writers who've never finished a book. Yeah. It's not always even, it's, it can be, I'm not saying they're undisciplined, but it's right. a confidence issue or a process issue. It's almost never a quality or their ability to write issue. Right. It's always some other thing beyond their ability to write. And right. uh, so I have so many writer friends that I'm just endlessly frustrated by. It's like, you would, you would write this great piece of a great novel and we'll never see it, unfortunately, but that's, it's common. It's fine. No one should write a novel. They don't, feel like it or don't want to get into it but yeah absolutely and yeah I, I don't think people like as you mentioned it's not always a self-discipline thing there's obviously health factors life uh, but yeah I know I know some people who are just am, amazing writers who breaks my heart when I'm hearing that like yeah I haven't written in a year I haven't written in a year and a half it's like oh my gosh um, that's a loss for everybody mm -hmm. so a uh, very straightforward question part one of two do you have an agent no, I don't. Um, I went through the agent process. That was what was interesting with Unsolicited. So it was like a year of trying to get an agent for this book, getting a few agents who like would bite and see some additional chapters, but then ultimately pass. Um, and going back to other agents who looked at previous works, who I, I don't know if they ever actually want to see additional works when they say that. Um, and then submitting to smaller presses and then completely forgetting I submitted. Not completely forgetting, but just kind of like I put the story down. I kind of always had this, like I have this philosophy where I'm like, all right, after a certain number of, you know, revisions, years, like once I've kind of 
um, exhausted things. I put it down and I'm not beat up about it. I'm just like, all right, I have this story that I'm happy with. And if something comes up later, it's there, but I'm going to move on to this new project that I want to work on. Um, so I started working on a new novel and I was literally 30,000 words into this novel that I've since put down, but then that's when Unsolicited reached out and were like, can we see some additional chapters? Um, and it had been nine months since I submitted to them when they reached back out to me. And at that point, I was like, I don't even know what, I don't even know what section, I, I don't even know what version I sent you because I was doing some revisions in between. And they're like, well, send us what you're happiest with. Um, and then, yeah, it went from there. It's, it's such a slow process. Oh. It, publishing is such a slow process. I mean, writing is a slow process. Yeah. I remember when people like, you know, my last novel, my only novel uh, was uh, research, had a lot of research. It was an alternate history. And people would ask about the research process. I'm like, that was like seven years ago. I don't remember what I did exactly. And I read a lot. That's all I remember from the research process and took notes. I, yeah. I can't give you more details than that because the process, by the time I finished writing and revising and querying and my agent submitted, it was like, that was history. That was history. The history I researched was part of the history. Anyway, was, <laughs> there's so many not. levels of history at that point. Um, so he, this is a leading question, a self-confessed leading question from Amy from the Writer Center. There's self-discipline and there's also accountability, right? Do you find value in each? Mm. So self-discipline being obviously I can sit down and write and accountability being you're setting something up with a person and saying, hey, I wrote a page today. Yeah, I do. And I think um, I haven't had that in a while with anybody. Um, and I, I kind of miss, there's something nice just about that interaction that I think kind of keeps you up because the writing process can sometimes bring you down. Um, I think there's value in that. And yeah, I think there's connections are important for a writer. I know it's often a thing that you do in isolation, but yeah, those, 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 those accountability relationships are important as well, for sure. And I think they come in, in weird ways too. Like I got a buddy, Tyson, Tyson Morgan, who's a, a fantastic writer. And it's almost like we catch up, you know, every three to six months. And that's almost like a check-in, like, how is your writing going? And it's also like a mental health check-in, it feels like at times, and just like a confidence booster. And, you know, like, I don't know, it goes back to the graduate school thing where like you develop those relationships and you could develop them in any, in any form, but it's, it's nice to have those for sure. Yeah. Uh, one more publication process question from the chat. So, uh, the question is, did you do multiple submissions? And I just want to clarify that generally in publication, multiple submissions generally means you're submitting several pieces uh, to the same place. Simultaneous submissions are submitting the same piece to several places. So that's just a quick clarification on the usual terminology we see in publishing. So uh, I, I assume you were not doing multiple submissions, no. but were you doing simultaneous submissions? Absolutely. For the book, yeah, with agents and stuff, for sure. Yeah keeping a detailed list of who I reached out to, to avoid duplications or hitting up agents, two agents from the same agency or two, you know, um, and then noting when I, you know, when the rejection came or if they asked to see additional pages, uh, when that rejection came, because that's also beneficial to have, you know, you, you always have to assume you're going to have another novel. So it's good to have those notes about like, oh, this, this, you know, agent said that they were interested in seeing something else or that they had something positive to say about it. However, the market they were looking at didn't fit or like I had one agent who mentioned specifically like that she, she enjoyed the writing, but her focus more now is on historical fiction. And the thing I'm going to be getting back into is historical. So I'm like, oh, okay, I, I'll reach out to her when that time comes. So, yeah. At some point, the submission process becomes a spreadsheet. Yeah. It's really, really handy to have a spreadsheet. And uh, some writers do more detailed ones than others, but some level of that is, is pretty necessary. Um, and I think simultaneous, simultaneous submissions are expected. Yeah, for sure. And because the response time can be, you said nine months before this publisher that published your book got back to you. Yeah. If you waited nine months between right. agents and publishers every time, suddenly years and years and years have passed and you've, you know, that's too slow. 
Yeah. Uh, so you almost have to do simultaneous submissions to have any real chance of being published. Uh, I'm kind of offended when I see a no simultaneous, like when I go to magazines that are like no simultaneous submissions, I'm like, really? Cause you're going to get back to me in six months. Like that's insane. I get it. I guess I get it. I don't know, but yeah, definitely simultaneous. Cause yeah, you'd be dead by the time you heard back from anybody. So I want to uh, ask a question about characters because Ford is a really great character and very interesting character and a really well Thanks. rendered character. So where did Ford come from? Uh, Ford came from that early workshop with Boz. Um, and the one of the layers that Boz had was you pick a, a personal experience, but then you build it on kind of like a classic or an ancient story. So in earlier drafts, the story, um, obviously for folks who haven't read it, it's, uh, there's many components, but one is about uh, this father reuniting with an estranged son after several years and his son's turning about to turn 18. So he's kind of coping with the fact that he's not sure what the future holds for them. Um, but in the earlier draft, it was these two brothers um, and it was based on Cain and Abel. Nobody gets murdered in my book, but in the early version, it was kind of looking at this damaging relationship. And I think Cain and Abel <laughs> informed it in a strange way definitely pulled some experiences, you know, you borrow things from your own life and things that you pick up from other people's lives. He's a collage artist. And the more I think about it, that's what writing is, right? You're just pulling all these different parts together and sewing them all up to create this well-rounded character. So I aged for it eventually because it was this brother dynamic, but then I wanted, I, I thought it, uh, you know, it, it made the di it made it a little more intense to have this father-son dynamic, this, this broken relationship. Um, and yeah, I think just through the revision process, I just learned more and more about him. Early on, he wasn't an artist. He was kind of this sad sack of a salesman who wasn't good at being a salesman. And I wanted him to have a little more, I wanted him to have a little oomph and a little you know, agency and just something that you could admire. I wanted him to have some admirable traits because he's a, in a lot of ways, uh, not a very likable character as well in some, in some aspects. Well, I'm glad you said that because you are a very likable person. So also this is a character that's just like, it is not a thinly veiled version of the author, uh, which is, uh, there's nothing wrong with that method right. of writing, but it's, that, that is not at all what's happening here. So you've really, it was interesting hearing you say that long process you went through because um, you didn't just, you may have drawn, we always draw from personal experiences. I know that, but it was not just a character drawn completely from personal experiences and slightly fictionalized. This was someone very far away from who you are uh, in terms of age, experiences, likability. <laughs> um, um, do you, how much, how much of the character changes just as you're writing? How is character related to the process of putting words on the page for you? Say that again. Sure. So I'm just like, for, when I write, like just language leads me to develop characters sometimes by the way the words appear on the page when I'm using a certain character. And so the process of writing, I discover the character through the process of writing. Like I don't have an idea of this character when I start. Um, characters surprise me a lot. Do you have any of that? Yeah, no, I definitely get surprised a lot. And I kind of like that about it. I think it slows down. I, I do know people who like outline and they create this whole background story and I, I actually am trying to do that a little with the thing I was work that I'm going to get back to working on. But in general, I like to let the care, I like the, the writing to lead and, and guide me. I think um, it's just in a lot of ways more fun. It's slower because you do, I mean, these characters are changing a lot. But yeah, I just love that, that explore, you know, just exploring on the page and figuring them out. And then things kind of just, yeah, they just uh, almost on like a subconscious level, it starts to all come together. But obviously you're, you're putting in a lot of effort to shape it the way you want. But um, yeah, it's just a really beautiful process to spend that time with characters. So lastly, I sort of want to talk about, since I've known you since early days of your writing career through today, the evolution of your craft. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing we don't, haven't really talked on one of these chats about before is how you view old work through the lens of your current writer self. Uh, I still remember pieces you read. 
uh, what's the shampoo? Uh, uh, what's the oh, shampoo? Gosh. Green gold or something? <laughs> yeah, the shampoo. The shampoo piece about your dad. Yeah. Liking, uh, yeah. What's the name of the shampoo? Uh, uh, Pert Plus. Was it Pert Plus? No, or no, it was Prel. It was Prel. It was Prel. Prel, Prel, Prel. That's right. Which I always think of as Pert Plus. But yeah, you yes, that, Prel I do piece. Too. that said, you're laughing at it now, but that piece is stuck in my head like 12 years later from the first time I heard it. So, uh, uh, but how do you view your older work? especially pre-MFA work, when you're going, finishing your undergrad, going to these summer workshops to sort of figure things out. How do you view that older work and how do you think it compares to what you write today? Not necessarily in quality, but what, what mm -hmm. values have carried over from young Thomas writing to you writing today? Yeah, I feel like a lot of the, the early stuff I wrote was more autobiographical. Um, but then oddly enough, like I, I would write those short stories, but I was always working on novels and the novels never felt particular, you know, like one was about a hitman, another one was about, oh gosh, I can't remember. Um, but I feel like, um, I think humor is one thing that's always been throughout my writing, but I think it's gotten much more sophisticated and subtle. I feel like I, when I was first started, it was just, you know, this, like, you know, if, I've never been like, big into painting but I imagine like you get all these these colors and you're just like I just want to throw them all on this canvas and I want to it, this is amazing look at all these colors and like I feel like that's where I was early on it was just I had a lot of enthusiasm which I think is important I still feel like I do but I feel like that enthusiasm kind of got me through some of the you know the rounds of rejections and it's like all right well I still like this so I'm gonna keep doing it and um I think, yeah, that kind of carried through, carried me through and, and humor has always been really important to me, kind of balancing, balancing that in your, in your works where, you know, I just love the way, like, my favorite thing as a reader is to laugh, to, to almost like laugh and cry within a page, you know, like, um, I just read Sarah Ann Strickley's novella, Sister, and I, um I messaged her afterwards I was like you literally had me choking up and dying laughing in a matter of like three paragraphs and I think that's something that I've kind of tried to you know work on throughout my my writing career getting better at that range as a writer I think range my range has improved over the years I don't look back at a lot of the old stuff I write I mean I remember it but um I do yeah. love that idea of excitement, though, and how that important that is. And and you can be reckless when you're figuring it out because none of that stuff can get published anyway. Right. And uh, yeah, there's something there's something fun. I mean, that's sort of where you learn the fun of it a little bit too. I think. So learn the fun of it, and that's how I approach most first drafts because I realize you know the first draft is going to be terrible. So like as as long as I can kind of or like go through it with a lot of energy and enthusiasm like it'll at least get me to the end or I can have some vague idea of what the story looks like realizing it's going to change completely but I at least have a foundation um, and I think enthusiasm helps you know and energize you as you write. I have a couple more questions that I think will be the last couple we take from the chat before wrapping up today so this one's uh I, this I guess is so sp spanning your whole writing career, who is the favorite character that you've created and why? I really like Emily in my not in my current novel. I feel like she's a really grounded and kind of like I don't know, just just the a, a really solid character around a lot of characters who have so so much baggage i just feel like she's somebody who obviously has gone through a lot um but she's come out of it and has been able to kind of get beyond where a lot of the other characters aren't so i really am fond of emily and i find i'm fond of like my like you know i have a lot of like minor characters that maybe because they don't i haven't spent as much time with them i just love the minor characters like uh yeah but emily is a special one I love my I love minor characters. They're so much yeah. fun to write. They they have so much less responsibility, but at the same time, more like you have to do them right. But like, yeah, to sustain it. Maybe that's it. Like, if I get them right in this one moment, that's all they need. Yeah, I love that moment. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one one quick just quick answer question is: these days, are submissions electronic or hard copy? Uh, I can pitch in on this too. But your your experience in this book, electronic versus hard copy submissions. Electronic all the way. Yeah, I don't. I, 
I, I know a few journals that occasion that claim to accept only paper, and I just don't submit to them at this point. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't mailed a submission in probably seven years, five, six or seven years at this point. Certainly not since I moved to DC. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. So, uh, and then I think the last question we have time for from the chat is a simple one. Uh, across all your writing, do you tend to write in the first or third person? Ooh, so this story started in the first person. And for years, it was, and, and I always kind of gravitated towards first person because some of the earliest books I really loved were first person. And that was the only reason. Uh, I mean, I like the, you know, just the intimacy of first person and that kind of, it's fun to try and write you know, what, what are you withholding? But my, again, bringing up Tyson Morgan, um, he kept insisting this could, this is not a story that is meant for first person. And I was like, I don't know, Tyson, I like the first person. He's like, this guy would not tell this story. He has no reason to tell this story that you're trying to tell. Um, and once I finally accepted that, it opened the story up and it allowed me to go places. Um, and then the new piece I'm working on is third person. Uh, but I do have a soft spot for first person. I love, I love, you know, like Gatsby, What Remains of the Day. Um, there's just so many first person narratives that I love. Um, but yeah, lately it's been third person. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, what's one piece of writing advice you'd give to a writer just starting out? Um, just be patient and keep, keep doing it. There's, there's no one way to get to publication and some journeys are long, some journeys, those really, uh, those ones that occur overnight, you don't like those, um, but be patient and just keep keep plugging away. I mean, the only, the only way you fail is if you're not writing um, and, or the only way you're not going to achieve what you want is by not writing. So just keep writing and it'll eventually, it'll come. Well, Thomas, I am so glad to see you just in this virtual space. And everyone, yeah, man. please go buy a copy of The Wind Under the Door. Uh, it's, oh, oh <laughs> we're trading. Uh, it's, it's a awesome. really, really fantastic book. Um, uh, not, not mine, his. Mine's okay. But Zach's uh, is fantastic too. But it's so good to see you. Thanks everyone for coming out and have a good night. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys very much for coming out. Thank you to the Writer's Center for having me, Zach. It's a pleasure. I love you, man. And I'm so happy to be seeing you on my screen. Bye, everybody. <laughs>